Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another special edition of The Pulse. I'm Kiana Faircloth, host of Afternoon Jazz on WBGO, Monday through Friday from 4 to 8 p.m. And I have this evening the winner of the DC Jazz pre-competition sponsored by the DC Jazz Festival, Elijah Jamal Balbet. He was the winner of the 2020 competition and he'll be joined by this year's finalists of the DC Jazz pre-competition. And I am just really, really excited to welcome on my brother, Elijah Jamal Balbed to the pulse here. Hey, Elijah. Hey, hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great. Good to see you. Good to be with you. You too. I feel like it's been such a long time. It has. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. You know, things have, you know, moved in different directions here, but I'm happy that our paths have crossed again here. And congratulations on winning the 2020 DC Jazz Pre, man. That's huge. Thanks so much. It was a huge honor and uh, exciting news during what was a dark time and uh, unfortunately dark year. Yeah. Let's, let's actually go back to that because when you applied for DC Jazz Pre, it was in 2019, right? Mm -hmm. So what was it like when you found out that you were a finalist amongst so many different, just amazing musicians from all across the globe, really? Yeah, well, I knew from seeing the competition in past years, uh, living in DC, I've, I've seen a lot of them up close and personal, how competitive it is and how high the level of musicianship for the people that apply is. Um, so when we found out we were uh, amongst the top 15, I believe, uh, it was it was a moment of, oh, crap, this just got real. Um, <laughs> and me and the other guys in the band, we started uh, getting together more often at first, not just not even just rehearsing, but just kind of like getting together, hanging, establishing that vibe because we had been playing together for a few years, but we knew that we needed to have a, a tight vibe on stage. And then we started rehearsing and just uh, mentally and also physically prepared ourselves the best we could. And uh, it was just mind boggling when we found out we won. Who's in the band? Um, on piano, one of the hardest working men in show business, Mark G. Meadows. Yes. On, yep. On upright bass, Elliot Seppa. And on drums, Kelton Norris. Nice. So going into the competition, you know, of course, you're a native to D.C. just as I am. Honestly, were you kind of shocked that, you know, you would have won as a D.C. native? Because these competitions, you know, because they draw so many folks from all over the place. It's not a necessary shoe in just because you're from the place where the festival is, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was definitely a shocker. I mean, for one, D.C. has a stigma of not being a music town or not having jazz here. But if you know your history, I mean, there's so much jazz that came out of Washington, D.C. This is where Duke Ellington got his start. Marvin Gaye lived here. Roberta Flack, the list goes on. Um, so it was it was a shocker. Um, but it also felt great to represent D.C. on such a high level and in this international stage. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> the pandemic hit and I'm sure that slowed down a lot of the momentum that you felt you would have, you know, had after having come off of the high of winning the DC Jazz Pre. What has your life in quarantine and the pandemic and, you know, all of that, how has it been for you? Yeah, I mean, I think most artists will tell you there were some there were ups, but a lot of downs during the pandemic, um, not being able to, for one, perform for audiences, but also just be around your friends, be around the people that you make music with all the time, being secluded to our own homes, not knowing what our futures behold. Um, it was it was a pretty rough time, um, and, but it also allowed me to focus on things like recording mm -hmm. and teaching as well. I was able to keep some of my students and I was really proud that some of my students took this time during the pandemic to really get in the shed and are sounding great. Um, so I tried to remain optimistic throughout all of it, even through the tough times and and really just push through. And again, like when the competition came up, this was just, you know, a beacon of shining light when 
things weren't like going so well during the pandemic. So I was extremely grateful. Yeah. Now you of course have been on the jazz scene and, you know, on the radar of folks for, for a while now, and not only, you know, for your musicianship, but your activism too, you've done some things in DC to make sure that musicians are, you know, being taken care of. Um, talk to me about how you feel you've been trying to do more than just make music, you know? Yeah, well, part of that just comes from, you know, being in DC. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I didn't pay much attention to, you know, some of the things that happen right here in the city. But then as I got older, I realized we're footsteps away from like the city council building and, and from Congress and the Senate and everything. So um, it just kind of felt like part of my civic duty to kind of incorporate some of those politics within the music. And that's actually what how the music that helped us win the competition was was created in the Karma Suite um, during 2015 through like 2020, we experienced some of the some of the craziest days politically and some mm -hmm. really challenging times, some really divisive times. And so I just found myself um, emotional about a lot of these things and mm -hmm. sitting sitting down and, and writing music about them. And then when the pandemic hit, um, one way that I was able to use my leadership skills was to organize uh, park concerts around the city and I was able to end up putting a lot of different musicians to work because we started just casually performing around town um, at different like pop-up situations, but found mm. that the people were so deprived of live music um, that they really you know, appreciated us being out there and showed it uh, with you know, cash donations as well as like virtual tips and things like that. That's beautiful, man. Thank you for doing that. Thank so you. what's next? What's next for you now that you have won DC Jazz Pre? What what can we expect from you next? Right. Well, we will be performing at the festival this year, Sunday, September 5th at 2 p.m. The EJB Quartet, the winning band from last year, will be performing with special guest Benny Banak on trumpet. Nice. And we are also continuing to record and produce the music from the Karma Suite. So right now, a few of those tracks are available on Bandcamp and Spotify and everything. Um, but more of that will be coming out soon. And the full project will also be available on some sort of physical product, be it CD or uh, hopefully vinyl or something like that. Nice. Awesome. Well, I would love for you to impart some of your wisdom, <laughs> some of you know the experiences that you had going through DC Jazz Pre with this year's finalists. So let's bring them on here. We'll start with ladies first, Miss Camila George, who hails from Nigeria right now. It's about 1 a.m. in London right now. Welcome to The Pulse, Camila George. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for being up. <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> Wow, hang in there. I'm gonna bring in the rest of the finalists. Diramir Gonzalez is here. Right now he's in Mexico City. Uh -huh. How are you doing? I'm doing amazing, very blessed. I'm happy to connect with all of you guys. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness, amazing. You're welcome. And last but certain, certainly not least, Gifton Jelen joins Hello. us here. He's in New York City, doing? welcome. Doing good, how are you? Great. Let's get into it here. Let's start with Camila. You started playing the saxophone when you were very young. You were about 10 or 11 years old? Yeah, I was 11. I mean, I did actually try sax when I was eight, but that was vetoed. My parents were just like, nah, it's too expensive. And you wanted to do gymnastics, you wanted to do this thing and he gave it up. So yeah, I had to wait till I got to what we call a uh, secondary school here. And I got a saxophone at school. So you won, I understand you won a competition that got you lessons. Yeah, there was a music competition. I could see that they were saying all these like all these instruments that you could win uh, lessons for, and I was like, sax is on the list, right? I'm going to enter, and uh, yeah, so I, I won it. So it was, that was good. That was the beginning of uh, everything, I guess. 
It must have been fate. Now, what drew you to the saxophone? First of all, who were your influences? Well, my dad um, was a massive jazz fan. He had a lot of vinyl and every Sunday was enforced listening of Sonny yeah. Stitt, Jack McLean, and he was just such, such a jazz head. So I really, I think he was, that was quite formative for me because obviously I was listening to that music from when I was about five. Um, so by the time I was 11, I definitely knew that I liked jazz. Now, just curious, did you see any women playing the saxophone growing up? Um, not growing up, no. Um, like in the UK scene now, it's completely different. There are loads of women at the forefront of this, what they call the new wave of jazz, I don't know. Um, so, you know, that really changed within an organization that I became involved with from the age of 11 called Tomorrow's Warriors, who are dedicated towards getting kids from all backgrounds, um, they focus on uh, kids from ethnic minorities, black, Asian kids, um, who at the time in the UK scene, like when, you know, when I was bopping about 90s, um, early noughties, that wasn't, they weren't represented. So that this organisation is a really big reason why now we have a diverse scene in the UK and like in terms of ethnicity and gender. So yeah, that was that was the thing that that helped me. But yeah, growing up, I didn't see any female influences. Wow. No. Yeah, great work you're doing now. Let's bring uh, Dyramir in here now. Dyramir, you're a Yamaha pianist. You're endorsed by Yamaha, but not only that, you sort of made history as the first Cuban national to win the Presidential Scholarship at Berklee College of Music. Mm. That was that was a a dream that I, I thought that uh, it wasn't it wasn't actually made for me. I mean I because you know while I was performing jazz in Havana with different bands, I used to see a lot of Berkeley uh, teachers and even Berkeley students coming to Havana, learning with you know with us all the Cuban jazz or the Cuban salsa all the stuff. Um, but I always saw Berkeley like an untouchable type of goal. You know, because, you know, all the many of the best musicians that I admire, you know, used to be at Berkeley. So mm -hmm. when when I got the opportunity to study there, it was mind blowing. Uh, I always said that uh, the best of Berkeley is just the amount of networking and an amount of amazing, talented musician that I that I met. That's priceless. You yeah. know, from Georgia, Azerbaijan, killing pianists with a lot of different type of color from the year folk and, and different ethnic. And when they sit on the piano with the classical background and then expressing differently, you know, it was amazing to be in that environment, absorbing, you know, me bringing my 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 taste to the table with Cuban music, with my angles, and my Africanness. But it was amazing to be in that environment for yeah. sure. I'm sure. Now, tell us about your band that actually got you to DC Jazz Pre as a finalist. This is a, you know, in New York City, it's very hard to, you know, to as a leader to have a band that you can sustain because you need a lot of gigs to sustain that. A second, most of the most no that the, you know these 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 musicians are so amazing that of course everybody want to play with them, you know. So so you perform with them and then when you call them again to perform in Blue Note or whatever, they say no, I'm already performing with you know whoever. Yeah. So it's hard to really have a core band, you know. So in 20, 2019, when I did the the you know became Yamaha, we did the first concert at Yamaha January 5th. That was a year actually that was very prolific for us, performing uh, the music of the Grand Concourse with what my album that I was releasing in late 2018. So I had a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, performance in Ron Scott, uh, anywhere. So 2019 was very, very, very well for us, performing wise. So it was, you know, very solid for us. Then we went to Havana, performing Havana Jazz Festival in 2020. Then the pandemic came and we had to review our life and everything. 
But uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that has been always you know great, great to perform with them. As you know, sometimes when you go to the west coast of the U.S., sometimes money-wise, it doesn't make sense to bring the whole band. So you come as a leader and you put together a band in west coast. But yeah. uh, this has been my core band since 2019. Oh, okay, awesome, awesome. Now, Gift and Jelen, you dropped out for a minute, but I'm glad you're back. <laughs> Now, you are considered a protege of the late Roy Hargrove, and you have really been making waves on the jazz scene, you know, over the past few years. You just graduated from Juilliard, from what I understand. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And not only that, you, you've you been making, I'm going to say you've been making the rounds as far as competitions go, because you also won the letter one award congratulations there thank as you. well thank you so much appreciate that so let me let me ask you this why are these particular competitions important to you i'm going to start with you with that question but i want to know from everyone else as well why is participating in something like dc jazz pre important to your career um yeah i i, I think one of the most important things is especially i know we all as artists we can relate in terms of having the opportunity to have the level of visibility that you'd want for your music. Because sometimes, you know, when we're coming up as musicians, we need, we need support, you know, and um, in terms of, you know, uh, the, the amount of means that we may have just coming up may not be enough for us to actually be able to actually push the music or may not even be parallel to the, to, to the quality of music we have. So it's not a problem about the quality of music that you have, it's more about how much support can you get behind the quality of music that you have? So I think having competitions like this gives us a chance to actually, you know, gives us a head start to actually be able to have the music that we spend so much of our lives, you know, we go through very much so, um, you know, unique experiences and being able to actually document that in musical form and actually be able to present it to the world. Um, Some place like, you know, DC Jazz Festival, having this um, competition helps for us to just continue to bring our music forth, you know, to the, you know, to the worldwide, you know, stage. So um, definitely appreciative of DC Jazz Festival for this. Mm, awesome. And what about you, Camila? Why is DC Jazz Free? Why did you find it necessary to apply and participate in this competition? Well, I think it's, yeah, I'd echo the same sentiments. I think for me, somebody that obviously lives halfway across the other side of the world, um, it's great for visibility internationally, which is something that any artist, I guess, at any stage needs. And particularly, I think, you know, with this year, this rubbish uh, previous year of coronavirus that we've had, I think competi- competitions like this are even more yeah. kind of important for musicians in terms of visibility. Mm-hmm. And um, also, I mean, obviously, competing with people who are such a high level is it ups your game it kind of, you know yeah. it's iron exciting iron, right iron yeah. sharpens iron awesome and what about you Dyramir? why did you find it uh necessary to apply for dc jazz free especially and i ask you guys this because you're so accomplished outside of this competition. So I'm just curious to know, like, why why, why DC Jazz Pre? Well, definitely yeah, uh, DC has a platform that I have a long story of presenting a lot of established artists that I admired. And uh, definitely it's a platform that, uh, you know, you have from Pedrito Martinez. I'm talking about just the, the Cuban language. You know, have Pedrito Martinez coming up. You, then you have another opera and coming amazing. It's called Sima Funk. Uh, you know, I encourage you guys to to hear me. He like Cuban Cuban funk music with you know Marvin Gaye type of type of different type of funk. Very nice. So it's kind of a great platform to you know to expose our music. You know, we are we are mostly independent musicians who not only are focusing you know, keeping our technique and, and be able to, to express music of what's the best of us, but also we need to develop, we have able to, we have been, let's say, forced to develop the other side, which is the business side of setting our career, of presenting our career, but not only that, presenting our story. For me, the most important thing about this is another opportunity to be in front of a large audience, sharing my story, educating people, educating a web musical wise, 
you know, Cuban music, about Cuba, about my Nigerian roots. You know, I'm Yoruba myself, a practicing Yoruba religion, you know, coming from Benin, Nigeria. And, um, you know, I'm coming from a classical piano background. And somehow there is a lot of, at least in my corner of Cuba, in the United States, there is a lot of misconception about Cuba because of the polit political thing. So it's always a great opportunity to, you know, to say that a Cuban music is not only salsa and uh, Buena Vista Social right. Club. You know, there is a lot about Cuban music. So that's my... In, if this is what I what I bring to the table in this case is just the opportunity to have a platform to allow me to share my story with you guys that are amazing that have been listening to your music. I'm so honored to finally meet you personally. Uh, you sounds amazing, and uh, so it's gonna be just a beautiful journey of sharing music together. Yeah. So, Dyer, your background you say is in classical music. How did you find your way to jazz then? See, in Cuba, we had the opportunity to have an amazing system that supports anyone. It doesn't matter if you are a black dude like me who coming from a very rough neighborhood in Havana. I was able to have able to have a, an amazing a classical music school that allowed me to be exposed to a lot of music and uh, going all the way to the top without even resources, you know. So uh, when I was like, a, let's say, nine, ten years old, no, not even like 12, 13, my that exposed me to Irakere, Chucho Valdez, you know, Maestro Chucho Valdez. And uh, I didn't really know what I was listening. I just heard that uh, he was playing so much notes uh, in, in the piano that I said, man, that cautivated me. I want to follow. I want to study that. Then mm -hmm. I heard uh, Kenny Kirland performing this album with Winter Marsalis that I was just mind blowing, playing Jang Step. Later on, when I got to Berkeley, I was able to wow now yeah. you can hear no by not of what this guy is saying to me but then he was like speaking so loud to me like what is going on you know, it was yeah. so, much, so much information right overwhelming but uh yes that that was a also a, a jazz was also, was also coming from the necessity of expressing myself from a more open way because a classical music i always felt that i was like in, in a corset that you have to play the music of someone else but in a certain rigid way Right. You know, jazz was more open wise, color color wise, and uh, you know, more if you if you feel tired, you play less notes. If you feel excited, you play more notes. So it kind of I felt more relaxed to express myself in jazz than in classical music. Even though I had to go all the way to 20 years old playing classical, but that was my way. Wow. So it wasn't until you were 20 that you started playing jazz? No, 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 no. Even though I had to continue playing classical music all the way to 2021 20, in the university, oh. I was approached to, to jazz music with my dad, which is a trumpet player, when I was 12, 13 years old. Oh, got it. Wow. Interesting. It just seems like there are so many amazing pianists, particularly that come out of Cuba. So mm -hmm. it's no wonder that you... <laughs> you were surrounded. That, just that, that was a great decision making when I got to New York City. How to put my, you know, to fit myself among those 10, 12 musicians that have been so long. Elio Villafranca, Axel Augard. Oh, Elio is amazing. With you know, the I, I encourage you guys to hear uh, the El, 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 Elio Villafranca's last album, a uh, Grammy nomination. It's just amazing what he did with African music bringing into Cuba. It's just a journey of a lot of beautiful men. Giovanni yeah. Terry. Yeah, you guys know Giovanni Terry is oh, a yeah. player? I know Elio. I know uh, Elio. Elio. Uh, see, and I said, see, man. Indeed, so many amazing musicians out of Cuba. Now, Gibson, question for you. Now, you, from what I understand, were self-taught up until you were 10? Um, I started playing trumpet when I was 10. I was self-taught until I moved out. Um, from the Bahamas to uh, to go to Oberlin Conservatory first um, to study with the great Eddie Henderson. And then I transferred to Juilliard um, where I started studying with Joe Magnarelli and a great classical teacher named Ray Mace. Um, but yeah, I worked a lot with my mentor back in the Bahamas. His name is Adrian Diagla. He played bass. So a lot of my time was spent, you know, you know, just kind of soaking up the knowledge from someone as, you know, him being so experienced in playing jazz in New York and um, and it's also the California scene as well. So, um, yeah, it's kind of been something for me where I kind of had to figure out some things on my own. I would also mm -hmm. go to the Mahan School of Music summer camp um, when I was younger as well, when I still was in high school. And that would be, you know, some of, some of the sort of inspiration or things that 
kind of got me so uh, interested in being part of the New York scene away because, you know, I would come here every summer um, starting from 2014. And, you know, and those are kind of some of my, you know, uh, uh, formal sort of lessons. But um, being in the Bahamas, I kind of had to figure out some things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Incredible. So when did you catch the attention of Roy Hargrove then? So when I came to, when I transferred to Juilliard, I was all, I always would come to visit to visit New York all the time. But um, when I went to Juilliard, that was the first time I was able to live in New York City for the first time. And um, actually, before I went to Juilliard, I asked Roy, you know, to come to the Bahamas to help me raise funds, you know, to go to school. And, you know, it was so beautiful because he was one of my greatest, you know, influences, you know, on the trumpet ever since I started playing. So for him to come to my hometown, that was very special. And once I started living, he knew that I was going to be at Juilliard. So I would always catch him at Smalls and always catch him at places. He'd be playing at Blue Note and I would just, you know, just show my face all the time. And our relationship, you know, grew, you know, and it kind of happened really quickly. And, you know, because I, I, you know, I've always, I love every note he plays, you know, he's one of those people for me. And I just remember mm -hmm. that he always kind of, when he, when he saw me, he would say, hey, you know, gifted, you know, and it kind of just grew. And I just, you know, sit around and just hear him talk and, you know, and he's someone that taught by example. So, I, you know, some of the greatest lessons was to me to just be in his presence, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, that's how, kind of how it happened. Yeah. Wow. That's Beautiful incredible. story, brother. Beautiful story. Yeah. Now, I want Elijah you, to give you guys some advice here or, you know, share some of his experiences uh, that he's had post DC Jazz Pre and winning the competition. Um, so, Elijah, I'll turn it over to you. What would you say uh, would be the one thing that um, Camila, Diramir and Gifton should should take to heart in being in this conference in being in this competition. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, a few things. I mean, for one, it is a band competition. Um, so I mentioned that moment when we realized we were, you know, the five in the finalists and had to get real about being a band. I mean, we had been playing together for about four to four or five years before that, but we were also trying to figure out ways to create a set that, you know, for one featured everybody, uh, but also, I don't know if this is still a rule last year, it had to be 20 minutes on the dot. And so mm -hmm. we also had to figure out how can we, you know, feature a variety of music, uh, feature all the band members and create a compelling set within 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so personally, I actually uh, created a track in Logic. I, I, this is something that I pre-pandemic didn't have any you know, skills doing, but I started teaching myself at first on GarageBand and then kind of elevated to, to Logic. Um, and just at home on piano, uh, tracked you know, every part that I wanted played. Mm -hmm. um, I play some upright bass, so I tracked bass. Um, I'm not a drummer. <laughs> But I do have a symbol. Okay. <laughs> so literally, just like at home, uh, created a twenty-minute track that, in my mind, what basically it was a, a an oral vision, an oral representation of my vision. So like the band members knew exactly what I had in mind. Wow. And, and then when we started rehearsing, we could just like create off of that. Um, and it so just you really did like a reference track, I guess you could say, for each part. That's exactly. crazy. And then, like when we uh, when we got to sound check, we we like ran everything as if we were doing the gig, and it timed out perfectly. And then when we did the gig, um, I had my timer on, and it said at, right when we finished the last note, it said 1956. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. So we were literally like 20, almost 20 on the dot. How, um, how many how many songs were you able to play in total? I think we did a solid. It's all it's all on YouTube. You can watch it from last year. I think we did a solid four songs with a few interludes as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But each song like only had one solo. Um, it was one long set. We didn't, I didn't talk in between songs. We just played from song to song. And it, as opposed to just a, a, a group of compositions, it was a 20 minute story told in a musical format. Yeah. 
Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Wow. Thank so, you for the advice. Absolutely. So just being timely, number one, knowing the rules. Got to know the rules of the competition. Because if you had gone over 20 minutes, would you have automatically been disqualified then? I don't I don't remember. I don't I don't remember any clear language on that. So we were like, let's play it safe. Okay. <laughs> Right. Okay. So this year, will you all actually be going down to DC on the fifth to to perform? Yep. So you'll all be there with I your will. respective leaders. Yes. So, what, what what the question? Sorry. I was asking if you guys will physically be there in DC for the competition on the fifth, or will you be performing virtually? Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah. Sounds good, amazing. It's, <laughs> it's gonna be amazing to perform in front of the audience. You know, I'm more excited than that. That I'm even, <laughs> but, you know, just to see people again. That's amazing. Sure, I'm you know? sure. Yeah, sadly, um, the UK being what it is with good old Boris, um, we're not allowed into the states. So I will have to perform virtually. Very, very sad about that. Uh, oh, you can come? No, not at the moment. You, you haven't done the like the, the vaccine and stuff, no yet? Yeah, I have, um, but the UK citizens are not allowed into the States because we probably, because wow. I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's quite bad here. So. Man, yeah. man, politics is all over crazy, man. It's okay, it's probably more so our fault than yours. Right. No. <laughs> I say it, I say it, it's <laughs> Probably so. Okay. Well, on, on behalf of America, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. For technology, that you'll still be able to be there. I mean, they don't call you. I hear they call you the golden girl of jazz. They don't call you that for nothing. So. Beautiful. <laughs> hopefully, you don't you don't have to play at one in the morning. Uh, yeah, hopefully. Right, right. <laughs> oh yeah, there's that too. The time, the time difference. Yeah, Sally, what time? So yeah. you will be playing like around eight or something for you. Your time. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure of the time of the actual timings yet for the, but mm. if it's around this time, then it's one a.m. <laughs> so. oh my, well, I should let you go it's here, again. Camila, in just a minute. But before we go, I do want to thank all of you so much for being here. Good luck to you. I wish you the very best. Um, and even beyond this, you know, some of the greatest. If you think about some of the competitions that are televised, some of the greatest. Um, Folks that don't even win, you know, end up doing amazing things, you know, even after. So everyone's a winner, <laughs> I'll say. You guys are all killing, so your winner's already. Elijah Jamal Valved is the 2020 winner of the DC Jazz Free Competition. Camila George, saxophonist, Diramir Gonzalez, pianist, and Gifton Jellen, trumpeter. Thank you all so much. Before I let you go, I want you to tell everybody where they can keep up with you and your career. Ooh. So you'll be able to, so for me, you'll actually be able to find me on all on all uh, social medias, Facebook, Instagram, um, at Gifton, G-I-V-E-T-O-N, and then my website is giftonjellin.com, um, G-E-L-I-N, that's how I spell my last name, Gifton, G-I-V-E-T-O-N. Um, you can also find my album on all streaming platforms and also on my website, so yep. That's it. Beautiful. And thank you Camila. so much, Karen, for having me. You know, it's oh, a pleasure. You're welcome. Camila? Um, yeah, I've got a website. That's www.camillageorge.com. Uh, you can find me on the socials. Uh, Facebook, it's Camilla George Band. And on Instagram, it's at G one And my albums are available on Spotify, the, the usual platforms, Apple Music, etc. But you can also purchase them from my website. Mm. Beautiful. Right here. Same for me. Same for me. You know, dairamirgonzalez.com. And uh, also find me in Bandcamp so you can support and buy <laughs> our music that we, you know, self-produce. We have a lot of love for the audience. And uh, it's really about that, sharing love and sharing music, sharing, sharing the moment where we are. That's why we do albums, to share where we are in that moment, because that's a precious moment of creation. And then we go to another moment with probably another type of feeling. So in November, I'm going to be dropping a new album, 
you know, with, with a chamber orchestra. So I'm looking forward for you guys to listen to that as well. And, uh, you know, September 5th, I will give you guys a hug uh, with, with mask, but, right. I'm gonna, <laughs> but I'm gonna be there, okay? <laughs> si, senor. I love it. I may have to come back home for this. Elijah? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty easy to find online. EJB Jazz, just my initials, J-A-Z-Z, uh, on all social media, ejbjazz.com. And Darvamir mentioned ejbjazz.bandcamp.com because that's <laughs> one of the best places to support me. Uh, it gives you a much more fair percentage than you know streaming platforms do. Um, and then, of course, on Sunday, September 5th, the DC Jazz Fest, uh, the EJB Quartet will be performing at 2 p.m. outdoors on the wharf in Southwest Washington, D.C. So join us for that. It'll be a great time. We'll be soaking in the sun, what's left of it. And uh, it'll be great to see you all there and meet you. Hopefully this time, Elisha, you don't yeah. have to play 20 minutes. Huh? <laughs> so we can so we can Woo! we can fully fully enjoy you there with your band. Exactly, we don't have to rush through. But I'm going to be listening. And best of luck to all three of you. I can't wait to hear everybody. And thanks to Kiana for hosting this mm. awesome hang discussion. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you guys so much. The DC Jazz Fest is taking place September 1st through the 5th. Go online dcjazzfest.org and get your tickets before we go. I see there's a comment from the DC Jazz Fest artistic director, my friend Willard Jenkins. He says, talk about the international aspect here. Elijah is of Saudi descent. Camilla is Nigerian descent from the UK and Diver Mir from Cuba and Gifton from the Bahamas. Beautiful, <laughs> yep, beautiful display it's an of international the festival. diaspora of this music. So, si si Man, Well, good night, guys. Thank you so much for being here on The Pulse. Si, of si, si. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care and best of luck to you. Gracias. Thanks. Bye. Hasta, hasta pronto. Hasta Thank pronto. <laughs> yes. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for being here for this episode of The Pulse. And I will see you next time for another edition. So make sure you stay tuned. Sorry, I still got Elijah here. Make sure you stay tuned for who's next up on The Pulse. I can tell you in September, you can expect to see Mark Carey, who will be joining here to discuss his brand new album. So lots of stuff in store. Thank you for being here with us. See you on the radio Monday through Friday from 4 to 8 p.m. on Afternoon Jazz. Have a great night. <laughs>